Good evening, everyone. This is Duncan Johnson here, and today we will be discussing the domestication of Sus Scrofa, otherwise known as the pig. So to fully understand the story of their domestication, let's start with their wild ancestor. The wild form of Sus Scrofa is known as the wild boar, wild pig, Eurasian boar, razorback, or often just the boar. The wild boar is part of the order Arteodactyla, or even toad ungulates, belonging to the family Suidae, which includes animals such as warthogs and babirusas as well. Sus scrofa, and indeed all members of Suidae, are unique among terrestrial artiodactyls, in that suids are the only members of the order to be omnivores rather than obligate herbivores or, in the case of cetaceans, obligate carnivores, though those have not been domesticated. Suscrofa's reproduction is also uncommon among artiodactyls, as they give birth to litters as opposed to single young. The natural range of Suscrofa is very large, covering most of the Eurasian continent, with the exception of Siberia, the Tibetan Plateau, and Ireland. There are also populations throughout Oceania, Japan, and North Africa. Additionally, Sus scrofa has been introduced to the Americas, Sub-Saharan Africa, Madagascar, Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and multiple Pacific islands, and is widely considered a pest in most of these areas. An important question to ask is, why was the wild boar domesticated? Pigs are significantly less versatile in the products that could be derived from them than many other mammals, only being useful for their meat to pre-modern farmers. So their usefulness must be due to factors not related to their products. The most important factor in their domestication is their omnivorous diet. Wild boars have an incredibly broad diet, including roots, bark, fruit, invertebrates, small mammals, bird eggs, and even carrion and are able to eat all of the same foodstuffs as humans. One possible reason, then, for the domestication of Sus scrofa is in the broad-spectrum revolution. As populations increased and stress was placed on the populations of large, high-value animals, the lesser food requirements and more flexible diet of the wild boar was able to keep their populations high, leading to exploitation of wild boar and eventually management and domestication of the species. Another possibility is that, as their diet was similar to that of humans, wild boar populations would increase around centers of human populations as boars scavenged waste or raided food stores, and environments ideal for humans would naturally attract boars even without intensive agriculture. The boars could then have been kept captive as a convenient way to dispose of waste in such a way that provided a source of food in return. Pigs' similar diet to humans meant any locale able to support humans could also support a population of domestic pigs, meaning domestic pigs traveled easily, and as the reproduction method of giving birth to litters also means their population could grow quickly and thus the practice of keeping pigs could also spread quick. There are major challenges to identifying domestic pigs in the archaeological record, as wild boars vary greatly in size due to location and food availability. The top right image exemplifies this. Both of these boar skulls are believed to be males, and tooth wear analysis shows that both individuals were fully mature. Pigs do, however, show some notable morphological changes when compared to their wild ancestors. Like most domestic animals, they display classic characteristics of domestication syndrome, most notably a shortened facial region. Predictably, pigs therefore show a lower ratio between neurocranial volume and facial length than their wild equivalent. The characteristic most commonly used to distinguish between wild and domestic populations is molar size, with domestic pigs showing notably smaller second and third molars. The chart on the bottom left shows differing centroid size of several molars, 
sampled from domestic pigs and wild boars across Eurasia. Centroid size is calculated as the square root of the sum of square distances of dental landmarks from the centroid of the tooth when viewed from the occlusal surface. Now, the domestication of the pig is not believed to be a singular event. Analysis of haplogroups in both domestic pig and wild boar populations across Eurasia show signs of multiple domestication events in the Middle East, South Asia, and East Asia. The regions labeled D1 through D6 are regions where independent domestication events might have occurred, and the areas marked D1, D2, and D3 are where the haplogroups of resident domestic and wild pigs are more closely matched than to populations of other domestic and or wild pigs in other areas, suggesting independent centers of domestication. The earliest known site with evidence of domesticated pigs is Katalhoyuk in Turkey, a name that I almost definitely pronounced incorrectly. Beginning in approximately 9,400 BP, uncalibrated, sus scrofa remains are found at this site in great numbers, and the molars of the pigs found here decrease in size over time, suggesting an ongoing domestication event in the area. This is further evidenced by frequent signs of linear enamel hypoplasia in the pig molars. Linear enamel hypoplasia is a condition resulting from malnutrition or dietary stress that occurs in several animals, including humans. This condition occurs at much greater frequencies at Katalhoyuk than would be expected from wild boars. Haplogroup analysis suggests that the pigs domesticated in this area were ancestral to the pigs used throughout Europe and the Middle East. Pigs have been a very important livestock throughout history and appear in art frequently. The versatile diet, moderate size, and high intelligence of pigs made them inexpensive to raise. A survey conducted of mixed farming methods in several countries found that the weighted average water footprint of pig agriculture required 5,988 cubic meters of water for every 1,000 kilograms of pork, compared to 15,415 cubic meters for 1,000 kilograms of beef, or approximately 10,000 for sheep. In terms of food, pigs require only one-eighth the amount of dry feed as beef cows to produce the same amount of meat. This high efficiency, combined with their versatility, meant they were highly economical to raise by small-time farmers and lower classes, and were better able to thrive in conditions less favorable to other livestock, including places without pasture land. Pigs were understandably seen as a poor man's animal. Important examples include Odysseus being sheltered by a swineherd in his return to Ithaca before he had regained his title as a king, depicted in the bottom right, or the biblical story of the prodigal son, who, after spending all of his inheritance, was forced to work feeding pigs, a miserable occupation in which he nearly starved. Across many works, myths, and histories, pigs are widely seen as a poor man's livestock, pointing to the economic ease of raising these animals. Pigs are commonly vilified in common culture. To call someone a pig is to insinuate they are greedy, or dirty, or as a derogatory term for obesity. They are common symbols of warmongers and dictators. Day of judgment, God is calling Underneath the war, pigs crawling. Pigs are still majorly important livestock in the modern day, with over 600 million pigs in the world. Though still primarily raised for their meat, their bristles are commonly used in brushes, and they are being increasingly used in the field of medicine. Pig carcasses are frequently used to train tattoo artists and surgeons due to their anatomical similarity to humans. There has even been research into pig-to-human liver transplants. Though so far unsuccessful, the future of medical research looks bright, 
and pigs remain as one of the most important livestock kept today.